You know, I've been a theme park mascot for a while now. And over the years, uh, I just realized something. Some of these kids, those little brats, they deserve to. The costume I was forced to wear as a mascot for Derby's Funland was just not built for warm weather or user comfort. I was sweating profusely as I stood outside in the noonday sun, a silent prisoner in my oversized getup, as I put on a fake happy voice, dancing and capering with visitors, all the while dying inside. This wasn't what I'd picture when I'd decided to become a character actor. The costume had the oversized head of a cartoon dog whose gaping mouth I peered out from within. The character wore a blue sailor outfit, a blatant ripoff of a popular duck character created by another brand, a fact which I was heckled for constantly. Hey, Darby Duck! A little kid yelled, tossing his hot dog at me and staining my costume yellow with mustard across the front. It was the third time that morning I'd been assaulted by a child, which was my cue to take a smoke break. I began stomping away when someone called after me angrily. Hey, asshole! My kid wanted a show! Where do you think you're going? I turned around and saw a red-faced man with a large camera strapped around his neck. He was wearing a fanny pack and an Ed Hardy t-shirt. The devil child's father, I presume. Whoops! I said gritting my teeth and looking down at an obnoxious twerp who had just branded me with mustard. How do you Darby do, little fella? Are you having a great day at Darby's fun land? The kid leered up at me, grinning a gap-toothed bully smile. You wrecked my Darby dog. Now I want a new one. Wait, no. I want an ice cream cone, you big stupid dummy. The little snot knew damn well what he'd done. His dad hadn't seen it, but the two of us knew that he'd purposely ruined my costume with his hot dog, and now was blaming me for it. It was too much for me to handle. Maybe it was the heat. Maybe it was the fact that I hadn't eaten breakfast yet. Or maybe it was just the infuriating grin of that punk kid staring up at me, knowing he could get away with murder. I think you're remembering that wrong, little friend. You threw your hot dog at Darby. Yay! My kid wouldn't do that. Don't blame him for your clumsy ass. The little boy took a cue from his father and started crying crocodile tears. Derby's a big fat liar. If he ruined my hot dog. A moment later, the guy was attacking me, shoving me until eventually my manager had to come over. His face a frustrating mask of calm. What seems to be the problem here? This punk ass ruined my kid's lunch and now he's trying to blame him for it. I should sue you guys! Sure. Sue me for a hot dog, I thought to my head. Thankfully, it had gone too far by this point, and I knew better than to say it out loud. I'm so terribly sorry, sir. Please, follow me this way. Let me take you to our VIP lounge, and we'll get you and your son some complimentary refreshments. Looks like you need a refill there, too. He pointed at the dad's red plastic cup of beer, nearly empty. The guy finished it off in one long swig and tossed the cup at a nearby trash can, missing completely. Damn straight! Come on, Skyler! We're VIPs now! I'd seen this before. Some people tried to make a stink about everything just to get free stuff. But even this douchebag was taking it to another level. Even the kids seemed to be in on it. And they were gonna go get rewarded for this behavior? Hell no. I'd never even heard of the Derby's Funland Visitor VIP Lounge, but it sounded badass, and this guy didn't deserve whatever pampering he was about to get. I'm picturing champagne and caviar, cigars, and high-quality porno magazines. My boss looked over his shoulder at me with a glare and 
Uh, pretty much said that we had to talk later, then escorted the two away into a secret door hidden behind a fake tree prop. I followed them, thinking I would give my boss a piece of my mind. If he fired me, so be it. I'd taken enough abuse. The dark tunnel behind the fake tree was long and lined with ancient brick. It appeared to be as old as the park itself. Far up ahead, I could hear the echoing voices of the man and his bratty kid talking over the manager as he apologized. I hustled along to catch up with them. But then, the sounds of them talking abruptly stopped. It was replaced by a meaty walloping noise like someone tenderizing meat, except they'd forgotten to remove the bone first. As I walked quietly through the dark tunnel, the sounds of hammering eventually stopped and they were replaced by a different noise. It sounded like something heavy being dragged slowly over the cobblestones, slow and deliberate. Terrified now for reasons I wasn't sure of, I kept my footsteps as quiet as I could, peeking around the corner. My manager was up ahead with another person and they were tracking two dead bodies along, one large, one small and leaving blood trails behind them like giant wounded slugs. No, that's not possible. I must be seeing things that can't be right, I told myself. A door opened and closed, and they dragged the bodies inside. I hurried along, careful not to step on the bloody trails which had been left on the stone. When I finally came to the door at the end, I looked at the writing on the sign with stunned disbelief. Derby's Funland, in-house hot dog production facility, it read. Authorized personnel only. I pushed open the door and snuck inside. The room was dark and sounds of a machine running could be heard nearby. My heart began pounding and my chest feeling sick and lightheaded. I crept towards those sounds. What I saw in the back room I will never forget. My manager dropped off the two bodies and walked right past me. He didn't see me in the shadows as I watched what happened next. A huge man in a white butcher's apron was sharpening a cleaver. He was at least seven feet tall, his belly large and hanging over his belt. He picked up the limp body of the dead father and like he was a beef tenderloin, not even straining as he set him on the workbench in front of him. Blood poured out of his head, staining the surface red. Then he took the cleaver and began to chop, cutting him up into usable pieces. Each piece he stuck into a massive red machine that looked like it was from another century. A giant diesel belching automated meat grinder which took the hands, legs, arms and pieces of torso he fed into it and turned them into ground hamburger meat. I had no choice but to stay and listen to the sounds and to breathe in the coppery smell of that horrible room as he worked, first cutting up the father, then moving on to the son. If I left, I knew my boss would see me running out through the back tunnel, and who knew what he would do if that happened. This dark secret of Derby's Funland was not meant for my eyes. As soon as I thought it was safe, I bolted out of there, being careful not to let the butcher see me. When I got back to the break room, I collapsed on the couch. I needed to get out of here to tell someone, but first I needed to rest for a moment to process what I just witnessed. But before I could even begin to think, the door burst open. My manager and several co-workers came in. They all had their mouths full and chewing on holding hot dogs and my boss was carrying a tray loaded with the park's signature derby dogs. Hey, sorry about earlier, but guess what? It's Employee Appreciation Day. Free derby dogs for everybody. Eat up. What could I say? Even as terrified as I was, I'd forgotten to bring lunch and they smelled delicious. I picked up a dog and took a bite, then spoke with my mouth full. Hey. Did you guys hear they make these things out of assholes?
The day started with excitement, a trip to Luna's amusement park with friends to celebrate the end of summer. The park buzzed with energy, colorful flags flapping above, and the air filled with the familiar scents of popcorn and funnel cakes. As the day waned, I noticed someone in a park uniform who seemed to be everywhere we went. Initially, I thought it was a diligent worker, but after the fourth encounter by different rides, I started to feel uncomfortable. The person's gaze lingered too long, their smile a little too fixed. By evening, the thrill rides was replaced with a prickling sense of unease. I whispered my concerns to my friends, but they laughed it off, attributing to my love for horror stories. Yet, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. When we decided to split up, I ventured alone towards the older section of the park where the crowds thinned. The stalker's presence became more oppressive in the dim lights of the secluded paths. I quickened my pace, but the soft thud of their footsteps echoed behind me. Panic set in. I darted into a maze of mirrors to lose them. In the labyrinth of reflections, I could see the stalker's silhouette methodically pacing, always a few steps behind. When I was finally cornered, I confronted the stalker, demanding to know what they wanted. Their expression twisted from eerie calm to anger as I realized I wouldn't be an easy target. A heated verbal exchange ensued, attracting the attention of security. As the stalker was detained, I learned they were not a park employee but a troubled individual with a history of following park goers. The park closed, my friends found me, and we left. The once inviting lights of the park, now a beacon of warning in the night. That night I lay awake, replaying the events, grateful for my escape, but haunted by the what ifs. The park remained a place of joy for many, but for me. It would always be the place where innocence was lost to a stranger's dark obsession. Did you know that there's a second hidden Disneyland beneath the real one? In the early years of the park, Old Waltz himself decided he didn't like the characters traveling through the themed areas where they didn't belong. He said it broke immersion, so he had an entire complex built beneath the Magic Kingdom. It mirrored every street, every ride, and every land above it. The arrangement was designed to enable masked men to sneak around so well that your children would never notice, leaving you happy to foot the bill. Disney works very hard to keep it secret. Here's another fun fact. Every cast member has to be on stage whenever they're in potential sites of the park guests, even the janitors. That's where I come in. For the past 20 years, I've been cleaning up every type of mess that the park visitors have the ability to make. If you come off the teacups and paint the ground with the clam chowder you just ate at Royale Street Veranda, I'll be there. It's my job to whisk away the spunk with the precision of a diligent surgeon. It's a lot easier than you think, given the fact that we've been watching you from the very moments your tumbly got the rumblies. There are cameras on you from the moments you're shepherd into a parking spot in the morning until the tram drops you off after the fireworks at night. Things are fine if you know your place. I learned that pretty quickly. The first lesson sticks out in my mind. I'd been on the job for one year, seven months, and 13 days when a distraught-looking couple came to me and asked me where they should go to inquire about a missing child. I was in a zone immediately, leading them straight to the office on Main Street while explaining how park employees would have their daughter escorted through the underground passages directly into their waiting arms. Upon arriving at the office, I opened the door, turned around, and let them inside. Then I turned back, but they were gone. I was searching furiously for them. When the head security emerged, looking grim, I had gotten maybe three words out when he cut me off. Everything is fine, Sid. The parents have been reunited with their son. It was a daughter, 
That's right, their daughter. Why don't you take some time off? A week's paid vacation would give you enough time to visit Orlando. Did you know that park associates are entitled to complimentary park tickets and travel reimbursements? But what about the- It could be much longer than a week, Sid. He grumbled with the notes of very grave finality. I took the plane tickets, but went to the beach instead. I did very well for myself in the ensuing years. I cleaned things up, and I didn't question why our electric meters would occasionally record 10,000 megawatt hours used between closing at night and opening the next morning. There was no reason to ask why a dozen staff members frequently spent the night ferociously cooking food that none of the night staff ever ate. I never inquired about why there was a yellow door in the passageway under Adventureland, or why I got vertigo every time I drove by it. And no one ever questioned the firm policy of distraught families that had been separated. Get them out of sight. It breaks immersion. That reason was always good enough for me. But the strangest thing ever to happen was just a couple of weeks ago. I was in the underground Disneyland, spending my break by trying to forget about the poopy accident I had to fix in the Alice of Wonderland ride. A costumed Mickey Mouse came into the lounge, looked at me, then sat on the opposite couch with his legs crossed. I smiled and nodded, and tried to zone out, but it's hard to do when a cartoon mouse is staring right at you. And why was he still a mouse? The first thing I do upon stepping off stage is to drop my smile, let out a fart, and ease into relaxation mode. Why wouldn't someone take the first opportunity to take off a ridiculous mouse head? I stared back. He didn't move. It wasn't pleasant. I wondered if he was stuck in that damned thing, and obsessively started looking for seams in the costume, but I couldn't find any. My blood dropped a few degrees while my stomach turned over like a bleached whale as I realized there were no openings in the costume. I mean, what the hell? Was this guy so directly into the outfit? Was the illusion that good? Could my very dull imagination actually have conjured up the belief in magic? And why was he just staring at me? That's weird as hell, even without the fused cartoon mouse skin suit. There was no getting around the fact that this person was an odd duck who wore that fact like a badge of honor. Then, it blinked. I don't mean the man inside the costume blinked. I mean those giant mouse eyes rolled over to me, locked onto my face, and the anthropomorphic cartoon rodents blinked its goddamn eyes. We were alone in the room. And I was about ready to leave a bigger stain than that loose-bowled boy in the Alice ride. I opted, however, to turn and run into the hallway instead. I got a sudden burst of adrenaline-fueled energy when I heard rapid-fire footsteps behind me. I tried to outrun the thing, but my football glory days are a quarter century in the past, so that didn't work out very well. I think I made it about 300 yards before my burning lungs forced me to roll onto the floor and wait for my own untimely demise at the gloved hands of a mouse. But he didn't kill me. But through my blurred vision and desperate gasps, I was barely able to make out a very man-sized shape standing above. It was the head of security. He looked furious. Next to him was a man who looked vaguely familiar. He was tall, pale, and dressed in a gray suit with a fedora. He didn't look like he'd been running at all. Well, Sid, the head of security casually shouted, clearly less winded than I was. How about we send you to Europe for this vacation? I'm in Italy now. A few days ago, I started reading about other people who were coming out online about their Disney experiences. I stopped being able to accept the denial that I had worked so hard to maintain. I also noticed that a lot of other people on my tour had connections to Disney, despite the fact that we had never met before and were not part of a 
Disney sanctioned tour. It seems that we'd been gathered together on purpose, but someone clearly didn't want us to know what purpose that might be. It was a very odd situation at best, so I did exactly what I'd been taught to do. I separated myself from the situation. That's the best way to keep things clean. I didn't show up for the day trip to Genova. And in doing so, I was able to stay away from the bridge that collapsed a few days back that killed everyone else in my tour group. I'm the only one left to tell my story. And that story will end with me making it very, very clear. I won't be going back home. I think I'll be much safer living under the radar in Europe. Disneyland is hiding something big, and their greatest strength is making you believe that the magic isn't real. <laughs>